thank you so much for also helping us as we are, um, and I'm asking these questions, your questions are very often so much better than mine. Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're celebrating International International Transgender uh, Day of Visibility by discussing the work of organizations and individuals that support the transgender community. My special guests today are Rodrigo Heng Litenen, Executive Director of the National Center for Transgender Equality, and Susan Halla, Board President of Transparent. Remind us Zoom attendees that we'll take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results. And questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. I'd like to thank you both for joining us. It's, it, I, I'm so happy to be able to talk with you about these issues, particularly on, on this day, on this week. So I'm going to uh, set this up and, and I'm going to move over to you, Rodrigo, and your microphone, by the way, is, is muted. Um, as people gain the right to define their own sexuality and gender and identity, we're seeing a lot of others demonizing that. I mean, as, as, as people are able to be themselves, we see others now responding in a way that is basically saying don't, and don't certainly don't talk about it. Um, it's as if your right to be who you are ends if I don't like it. Uh, and that's not the America that, that I want to live in. And this demonization takes a lot of forms. We're talking about legislation. We're talking about uh, don't talk um, uh, rules in different environments. Uh, we're talking about intimidation. So, uh, Rodrigo, how would you assess the progress made over the last decades? Because certainly there has been uh, progress. There's now blowback. Um, it's a dialogue in American society. Um, how do you assess where we are? Well, it's certainly a very complicated picture right now. Uh, you're right that we are in a moment where a lot of people are being attacked for being transgender. And at the same time, we also are seeing more public support for transgender rights than ever before. So how is that? How do we have these two worlds together? Really what it's about is that progress always comes with backlash. That is just part of our history. It's part of how social movements work, for better or worse, that unfortunately, that when you make advances, when a marginalized group of people um, gain rights and, and grow support and move forward, there's a minority that is vocal and upset and works to counteract that. So right now, certainly, um, we are seeing more violence against transgender people, but we're also seeing more families accepting their transgender young people. And it's really, uh, it might sound like a contradiction, but it's really two sides of the same coin. And I'm confident that with us continuing to fight um, and continuing to kind of help the American public understand just what it means to be transgender, uh, the more that people will come to see that we're really just trying to get up in the morning and go to work and put food on the table like anyone else. Um, and then we'll see that support rise even higher. You know, I think this is a really interesting idea that at, when, when rights are asserted, when we see progress, we see, uh, we see also backsliding and, and response. If I go back to the Civil War, after the victories of the, of the Civil War and the abolition of slavery, we had as blowback the rise of the Jim Crow South. And, and what you're talking about, this idea of progress, when, when you take territory, you also need to defend it at, at the end. Um, and you have to engage people in that defense, Susan. Isn't that part of what we need to really be focused on in this, in this point? If we've made progress, how do we then lock it in? And then how do we deal with, with the blowback that people feel so that we are engaging them. We're engaging them not as opponents, but engaging them as partners. Well, I think the answer to all of that is education. And that's what I think Rodrigo and I both strive to do in our different uh, places of work here. Um, we work mostly with families with trans children is what our organization is all about. Um, the difficult part for us is that children, um, 
they see the immediate issues. So I'm not allowed to play sports anymore because of these bills or um, my teacher can't talk about my family and that I have, you know, a trans sibling, something like that. And they can't see this bigger scale of things going on. They don't historically, they don't have enough age behind them to kind of see history and know that um, we're all going to be on the right side of history. All of us sitting here today, I'm assured that we are going to be on the right side of history, but it's a matter of um, it's difficult for the kids right now to really understand um, that their immediate problems are going to help and benefit those in the future. You know, I have so many different friends on different sides of political divides, family as well, and and uh, people who are um, uh, liberal, conservative, progressive, all sorts of different different kinds of kinds of uh, things. And one of the divides is very traditional versus uh, non traditional. And traditional uh, folks uh, so often are, uh, they, they look at, at uh, LGBTQ plus rights and, and some other uh, changes, and they just feel that they are, that, that their way of life, their approach to things, uh, their ideas uh, are threatened. How do, you, how do we deal with something like that? Because isn't it true? Isn't it, isn't it true that these kinds of changes are threatening, Rodrigo? How do, you, how do you deal with that? Well, I think the key is to remember that at the end of the day, this is about human beings. Uh, unlike some other topics and policy where we might be talking about taxes or budgets or things that are abstract ideas, here we're talking about people. When we're talking about whether transgender people should be able to uh, just exist in public life without being harassed or discriminated against. We're talking about human beings just going about our daily lives. Um, and, it, and it is true that this is often thought of as a, um, a very divisive issue, but we see over the long time horizon that support is growing, including among people who are conservative and specifically are registered Republicans. You know, right now, um, when you ask, when you poll the public, not elected officials, but the public about whether they uh, support a, uh, a protections against discrimination for transgender people, um, 68 percent of Republicans say yes, that they that they support transgender people being protected from discrimination. Now, so maybe the, in Florida, if that's if that's true, uh, why? Because elected officials aren't stupid, right? They're doing this for a reason. So when they do it pur purposefully and you have 68 percent, I'm not sure that I buy what you're saying, Rodrigo, because you know, they can read the polls too. And they're, whatever they're reading is saying that this is, this is a winning uh, issue. It is a winning issue for them to, uh, for in the primaries, where only a tiny uh, fraction of the population votes, um, but it's not a winning for them thing for them in the general. So that's an interesting dynamic that is perhaps a topic for another day about the rise of partisanship um, in our electoral politics and the fear that a lot of um, conservatives and liberals alike um, in politics have about being primaried from the right or the left, meaning um, uh, the base, the uh, a concern about being less popular amongst the most extreme um, voters in their political party. So really we're seeing politicians pursue this um, attack on transgender people as some kind of red meat for that minority of extreme vocal uh, people who do vote in the primaries. Um, but it's not a winning issue um, amongst everyday people. Um, and I think the really, well, politically, what we really need is for everybody to vote and everybody to care about elections. So it's not just these extreme minorities. But then when it comes to transgender people in particular and, and the barriers that we face, um, it's always helpful to go back to the common values. So um, to your earlier question, Mark, if you're talking with someone who feels some kind of fear and anxiety about um, their worldview being attacked by this, 
Um, I'd say, you know, it's perfectly normal to have questions and, and it's okay to not understand this right away. It's okay um, to feel like uh, um, some trepidation here. Um, but, you know, let me, let me introduce myself. Let me show that I'm a transgender man and we probably have a lot more in common than we have different. So really going back to those fundamentals about the values and what we care about, that can be very, very humanizing. You know, uh, Susan, we just completed a, a, a poll in which we said, do you, do, we, do you believe that people should have the civil right to define their own gender and orientation and have that de- identity uh, respected? And everybody said yes, right? Everybody duly said yes. So in that sense, I guess, uh, Rodrigo's optimism would be justified. But I'm, I'm a little bit more skeptical because um, I do see uh, that people are using um, these these identification of, an, of a minority, in this case, people who are trans, as a way to develop power and signal support. I'm not sure that just communicating is going to be sufficient. Um, you know, I'm not sure that the civil rights movement would have would have been would have had the success if it had. And everybody just had a communication circle, held hands, and talked with each other. I think that that there were other actions that were probably required. Susan, how do you how do you see it? Are you going to join uh, Rodrigo on the optimi- optimism side, or do you believe that there's there's another aspect here that we need to really think about in terms of raw um, sort of activism and to, to try to ensure that we have an America that that is respectful of of these minorities? Uh, I will have to join Rodrigo in some optimism. Otherwise, what is life without (laughs) having some optimism? Um, But I will say that um, I've actually been asked several times now, several years in a row, to come speak to my kids' AP U.S. history and the AP U.S. Gov class because it's important, and I'm going to reiterate what Rodrigo said, it's important for people to vote. But I think voting isn't the be-all, end-all of changing politics. And that, in, that means that you need to get used to going to testify in person. You need to talk to your legislature, legislators. You need to talk to your family and friends. Um, and we're helping people do that by explaining, well, what is the process? And I think, you know, I always thought that voting was the be all end all. And I'm a, I'm a great citizen and I voted. And until I realized that the state house is my house. I can go there anytime. I can talk to anybody that's there, whether they're my legislator or not. Um, And I think teaching that to people and having more and more people testify and really talk about their stories is what's going to make the difference. That's a really important point, right? It's, It's basically saying everybody's a lobbyist. Right? You don't have to carry that little name tag. Everybody's a lobbyist. Everybody can assert themselves. And you're basically taking back uh, government for, for citizens, aren't you? Correct. And that's how it should be. I think uh, it's become so, one, it's become so politicized either side. I think I've had many great conversations with um, both sides of the aisle that I think um, are worthy of further discussion. But um It really is all about being that personal, your, not only your vote, but your opinions, your uh, interactions matter. So um, let's, let's talk a little bit about your organizations and we'll stick with you, uh, Susan. Talk about uh, Transparent, how it was founded and what your mission is, uh, what, what kind of work you do. So we were founded 11 years ago uh, by two moms that found each other on a chat room, uh, a national chat room, and found out that they both happened to live in St. Louis, Um, both uh, moms of trans sons. And they decided there's got to be more people out here than just us. So it started as just an organization in St. Louis. But um, in those intervening 11 years, we've actually... um, Now we're in 14 states. We have 24 chapters in 14 states where we provide um, open spaces for parents to get together and really talk about their trans or non-binary kids and, and, you know, some of the foibles, some of the... um, and then some of the, the accomplishments of their children. Um, and it's really important that we have that space to talk. Some things we can talk about to each other, we can't talk about with our children. Um, 
And so it, it's really been, um, it, it's grown, especially we've had, I can't remember how many, six new chapters open during COVID. I think because people were closed in, families were closed in and things came out and parents needed that support. And so we're really happy that we can be there. I started as a parent. I have a trans son who's 21, um, who's going to, uh, he's going to start in law school soon. So we have that to, to uh, look forward to. Um, but it's really, um, it's a, a great opportunity for parents to have that safe space. You know, parenting is such a transformative space, right? And then when you um, have an unexpected event occur that that we've we haven't necessarily grown up understanding, um, and and uh, to be deprived of a group of other parents who are going through a life transformative event is just uh, tragic. So to, f- to find each other and then to establish a group where parents can come together, it's just, it's just such a normal thing, right? I mean, it doesn't matter uh, what, the, what the topic is, we need that kind of contact. And uh, Rodrigo, you, you're at, at, um, looking at, at your organization, the National Center for Transgender Equality, you function also as an information clearinghouse, uh, but along a broader scale. Talk a little bit about what you do and your family. Sure. So at National Center for Transgender Equality, we aim to make it easier and safer to be trans in America. We do that especially through policy. We work with the state and federal governments um, and all of these agencies to lift the barriers that hold transgender people back. Oftentimes, uh, we deal with really nitty gritty policy stuff that most people would find boring. But you know what? These are the rules that govern our lives. These are the things that can make life easier or harder uh, for people who are trans, but also families. I mean, to what Susan was describing in a transparent is so inspiring because parents are reaching out to NCTE more than ever before because transgender people are coming out at younger ages. Um, and parents and, and extended family are really trying to figure out how can I help protect my child? I know that my child is living in a world that doesn't accept them yet all the time. Um, and oftentimes we hear from parents who are dealing with their kids struggling in schools. Maybe a teacher doesn't respect the child's new name. Um, maybe the school principal is targeting them for harassment. So we really seek to change all of these laws and policies Um, so that these barriers get lifted. Um, And right now we're especially working to pass the Equality Act, which is in the Senate. Uh, It's a federal piece of legislation that would really cement these protections for all LGBT people all across the country. Uh, So to Susan's point about testifying, yes, call your senators, no matter where you live, your elected officials work for you. So we really encourage you to get involved in the political process, find out who your representatives are and get involved. One of the things that that strikes me is there is a technique of suppression of voice. For example, you said, um, you know, part of our purpose is to make it easy to be who you are, right? And then that gets twisted into, oh, recruiting people to be trans, right? Which is really interesting because if you were to try to recruit me to be trans, it wouldn't work. But it worked. <laughs> it just wouldn't work, right? If you were to try to recruit me to be black or Latin Hispanic, it wouldn't work. And it's the same reason, right? It's I I define who I am, right? Being able to have a voice as uh, a Muslim or a Jew or or male or trans or whatever. Um, that's that's just my voice. It's not who I am, right, Susan? Correct. Um, and it, th- I think that's one of the biggest things to hit home is that my kid is still my kid. It doesn't matter what pronouns I use for him. He was born the way he is, and he is perfect, perfect what? in his way. And every one of us, uh, regardless of what our affirmed gender is, how what our sexual orientation is we're still perfect human beings in the way that we were made. So let's talk a little bit about voice and how, Rodrigo, you encourage uh, that voice. You were talking about um, uh, about sort of national um, advocacy, but we also have 
uh, um, issues that are coming on, on on local school school boards, right? Very, very, very micro local issues, um, and uh, not to mention things like violence and what goes on in newspapers and so on and so forth. Um, how do you have impact that is not on a national level, but on a local level? Because that's really where the action is. We all live in communities, so. How do we deal with that? And how do you galvanize that at working with other organizations across the spectrum? Well, we are now partnering more than ever with state and local organizations around the country um, because all of these levers of government matter. It is, um, and they matter equally. It's not as though the federal government has more power than the local. They just govern different things. They, they're, it is like they are just different jurisdictions. Um, so the local politics of your community are just as important and you can make such an impact there because it's, let's say with a school district, there's only so many people who live there and there's only so many people who even have a child enrolled in one of those schools. So if you fit that criteria, you have an outsized impact there. So at NCTE, we are now building out an entire program where we are partnering with state and local trans organizations. Um, because, you know, there may be a stereotype that transgender people only live in New York, San Francisco, and LA, but the truth is we're all around the country, right? Like Transparent was founded in St. Louis, Missouri, right? Like, and I'm from Miami, Florida. I mean, trans people are from any part of the United States of America, rural, suburban, urban, anything. So there are trans organizations and all of these places as well. So NCT, we're a national organization, but we are now doing an entire elaborate structure of partnerships with all of these local trans groups so that we can help them navigate this political process. A lot of people well, don't know about, how a school district works, so we're making it easy for them. What about non-trans trans groups? Because I think if, we are, if, if we're just talking to ourselves, no matter what the cause is, we're kind of missing the point, right? What we're trying to do is is uh, gain acceptance. If 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 you're not black and you're white, you should care about whether people are equal, right? It's the same thing. If you're not trans or you don't have any any relatives who are trans, uh, you would want to you would want to ensure that that uh, people have the ability to express. Uh, Susan and then Rodrigo, could you talk a little bit about how you reach across different groups to engage allies? Well, I think that's a really good point, Mark. Um, but I think what we need to do first is we need to we need to reach the low hanging fruit, if you will. We need to reach out to the families that are directly impacted and get them uh, solidified and lift them up and give them the the vocabulary and the understanding about how to. Um, how to then make impact in their communities. And after we do that, and after we feel comfortable with that, that the next step, step is to reach out to those allies or to have those people that we've you know, built up reach out to those allies and keep going from there. So it's, it's really support first, uh, Rodrigo, and then, and then once you get that sort of support, then you, you move on to outreach. Is that how you're looking at this as well? Well, for NCT with the local trans organizations, it's about teaching them the skills about how to get involved in the political process so that they can talk with the allies. And then on the federal level, we do that work with with um, with the federal officials all the time. You know, one of the things we do the most of on government policy isn't actually the elected officials. It's the government bureaucrats, the people who work at the Veterans Administration or the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. Most people may not know what those abbreviations stand for, but I guarantee you, you are personally affected by some of these rules. You just don't know who's making those decisions. So we work all the time with these government employees who maybe are working at the DMV um, or working um, at a post office, and they don't realize that something that they're doing affects transgender people. Um, so, And they often, don't know about our issues. So we have to break down the basics, but we try to make it really easy to understand and suggest concrete solutions um, so that they can take action right away. Do you believe, and we're, we're coming to the end here, so I'm going to give you, Susan, um, a last word and then go back to Rodrigo. Do you each believe that, that we will have full equality 
um, and societal integration for the trans community in the next uh, 10 or 20 years. Um, it's, we've seen a lot of progress recently. We've also seen that sort of response that Rodrigo, you referred to. Um, and so we've got this sort of seesaw and back and forth. Do you think, Susan, that we'll get to full equality um, in, in, in the way we're going? Uh, if we look on other marginalized communities, I would say the answer, unfortunately, is no. But will we get? Will we make progress? Yes. You you feel solidly that we are going to make progress. Yes. And I have a quote to... that I love. It says, "Just because you're offended doesn't mean you're right." Well, I think that's that's true. Would we go? What do you think? I agree 100%. We're not going to get uh, everything done in 20 years because no marginalized community um, does it that quickly, but we're absolutely going to make progress. And I think every single year is going to be better than the last. You know, I, I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to thank your staffs, your supporters, your funders. Um, I, I, I really believe that that respect for each other and listening is, is really important. And I think that with that, that uh, we must conclude as Americans, if we're going to have uh, an America that is based on founding principles, is um, we need to be respectful of each other and allow people to self-define and live how they wish to, to live. Um, I think that, that your freedom affects me uh, very personally, regardless to whether I'm trans or whether my child is trans, uh, in a very direct way. Um, and, and I'd like to thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you. Have a great day.